Hello, I'm Kristen Veloza. And I'm Cameron Brown, and this is The Global Current. Leaders from APEC, along with the United States, China, and Russia, met in Vladivostok, Russia, last week to negotiate members' objectives for the upcoming year. Staffer Heidi Erbsen files this report. Russia, which hosted the conference, used it as a platform to reaffirm its commitment as an enthusiastic member of the global community, pledging trade liberalization. Member nations focused on lowering tariff rates for a long list of green technologies in order to minimize environmental impact and encourage the development of renewable energy. The final joint statement stressed the importance of adhering to WTO measures, as well as the need to achieve a multilateral conclusion to the Doha rounds of trade negotiations. Parties also agreed to work with the WTO to combat protectionism and increase the monitoring of a national protectionist policies which stymie free trade within the region. The summit comes on the heels of Russia's official acceptance into the World Trade Organization on August 23rd. The long-negotiated addition of Russia makes it the final APEC member to join the WTO. U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton promised that the United States government would work to eliminate protectionist measures hindering trade relations between the United States and Russia. Putin has made it clear that Russia intends to continue steps towards further liberalization of its economy. A hugely influential organization in the global economy, APEC was formed in 1989 to support sustainable economic growth and prosperity in the Asia-Pacific region. It accounts for 54 percent of world GDP, and 44% of world trade. This has been Heidi Erbsen from The Global Current. Ecuador has declared an orange alert in eight provinces and its capital city, Quito, as forest fires continue to ravage the country. The declaration allows the government to authorize the armed forces to assist in fighting the fires on the ground in addition to using military aircraft to fight the blaze from above. The country's anti-disaster undersecretary, Felipe Bazan, told the Associated Press that there are twice as many fires than average. So far, two known individuals have been killed and thousands have been evacuated. Reuters reports that as of Thursday, September 20th, 33 fires are burning, many in the center of Ecuador. They go on to report that according to the Ministry of the Environment, more than 1,000 hectares of forest have burned in the Pichincha province. Over 41,000 hectares have burned since the beginning of the summer as the result of forest fires. On September 11, well over 1 million Catalonians marched in Barcelona calling for independence from Spain in the latest example of the fracturing of the Iberian state. For more on this story, technical producer Paul Murphy files this report. The rally, held on the 298th anniversary of the Catalonian defeat by Spanish troops in 1714, is the latest in the seeming fracturing of the Spanish state. Despite repeated calls from Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy and King Juan Carlos for unity, separatist party leaders have been relentless in their calls for independence. Support for independence in Catalonia has nearly doubled, reaching 46%. Catalonia, a wealthy autonomous territory in northern Spain, accounts for over one-fifth of the country's entire economic output and is home to nearly 16% of its citizens. Artur Mas, president of the autonomous territory, is a strong supporter for independence of Catalonia. The people and society of Catalonia are around the move, as we have seen on September 11th, and not willing to accept that our future will be gray when it could be more brilliant, Moss said at a news conference according to the New York Times. Moss has also stepped up his criticism of Prime Minister Rajoy after they reached an impasse in negotiating a new tax revenue redistribution plan. The Catalonian parliament sent Moss to Madrid with a mandate demanding an independent treasury and control over its tax base, much like the Basque region. The verbal blows have not been one-sided. The Telegraph reports that Spanish Minister José Manuel García Magallo called the Catalan secession illegal and lethal, warning that Spain would use its veto to stop the region of Catalonia becoming an EU member indefinitely. Confidencial reports that Mas's party, Convergencia y Uno, has asked the European Commission whether Spain can restrict Catalonian self-determination in addition to whether Catalonia could become an EU member. 
According to Spanish law, for Catalonia to successfully succeed, a popular referendum must be voted on by all Spaniards and would have to pass. In addition to that, an amendment to the Spanish constitution would be necessary as well. For three consecutive quarters, the Spanish economy has continued to contract. Nearly one in four people are unemployed. The Telegraph reports that Citigroup is expecting its economy to shrink by 3.2% in 2013 and 0.8% in 2014. Should that forecast become reality, public debt would reach 100% of Spanish gross domestic product. Catalonia has not been spared from economic troubles itself. In 2012, the region took out $16.6 billion in loans to refinance a maturing debt in addition to funding its deficit for the year. Paul Murphy, The Global Current. News from Oceania. Fiji has expelled an international labor organization team investigating working conditions in the island country on Wednesday. In a press release, Juan Samovia, ILO Director General, strongly condemned the Fijian government, saying that the decision puts a greater spotlight on the critical situation of freedom of association in Fiji and only fuels international solidarity with the Fiji Islands Council on Trade Unions and the Fiji's Teacher Association. AFP reports that the ILO delegation was meeting with Fijian Labor Minister Jone Usamate when they were informed that they had been expelled from the country for Fijian Prime Minister Foroke Binimarama decision to change the terms of reference of the mission. The investigation team was headed by former International Court of Justice Judge Abdul Karoma. The delegation, who sought to investigate complaints made by unions against the government, was not allowed to meet with any union members. The ILO was originally requested by the Fijian government to study the complaints. Radio Australia reports that Fiji later attributed the expulsion of the result of miscommunications between the ILO and Fijian government. The Fijian decision met immediate criticism from its Pacific neighbors, most notably Australia. The ILO's mission to Fiji was seen by the international community as a step towards improving and upholding workers' rights, Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade said in a statement to the Australian on Thursday. It is regrettable that the ILO's mission has not been proceeded. Prime Minister Beni Marama has held power on the island since the 2006 coup, which seized power from the democratically elected government. Beni Marama has promised to hold democratic elections in 2016. Protests over the film The Innocence of Muslims has spread across the world. News editor Zachary Kotz continues our coverage of this developing story. A deadly suicide attack in Kabul and new outrage over a French magazine's decision to publish cartoons mocking the Muslim prophet Muhammad are the latest episodes in a wave of unrest which has swept through the Muslim world. I also want to take a moment to address uh, the video circulating on the internet that has led to these protests uh, in a number of countries. Let me state very clearly, and I hope it is obvious, that the United States government had absolutely nothing to do with this video. We absolutely reject its content and message. Despite urging from its national government to reconsider, the French satire magazine Charlie Hebdo has published inflammatory illustrations which openly mock the Muslim prophet. The magazine, calling itself, quote, a defender of free speech and a denouncer of religious backwardness, went forward with publication as protests continue throughout the Middle East and South Asia. While the French government did press for the magazine to remove the cartoons, it stood by the magazine's right to free speech. As a precaution, the foreign ministry did announce plans to close embassies and schools in about 20 countries on Friday, the main Muslim day of prayer. The publication of the cartoons comes just days after a deadly suicide bomber attack in Kabul. The attack, which killed 14, targeted a bus which was transporting foreign citizens. According to the New York Times, a spokesman for an Afghan insurgent group, Hezbi e Islami, claimed responsibility for the attack, stating that the bombing was carried out by an 18-year-old woman, quote, in response to the film insulting the Prophet Muhammad and Islam. The attack in Kabul raises the worldwide number of deaths attributed to the widespread unrest to 28. As the number of protests continues to rise, the eyes of the global community remain fixated on these new developments which come more than a week after embassies in Egypt and Libya were attacked resulting in the deaths of U.S. Ambassador Chris Stevens and three of his staff. Attacks by rioters against the British and German embassies in Sudan, coupled with the new outrage against France, demonstrates what began as an anti-American sentiment is slowly transforming into a wider issue. The ostensive cause of the widespread outrage has been the anti-Islamic film The Innocence of Muslims, a previously little-known, low-budget, satirical depiction of the life of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. 
The film came to prominence after an Arabic translation of the movie trailer was posted on YouTube. Earlier this week, Ahmad Fuad Ashush, an Egyptian Muslim cleric, issued a fatwa to Muslim youth in America and Europe, calling on them to, quote, kill the director, the producer, the actors, and everyone who helped and promoted the film. This is Zach Kotz reporting for The Global Current. When we return, reports on the continuing impasse between China and Japan over islands in the East China Sea. Stay tuned. Just minutes from New York City and a few hours from Washington, D.C., the John C. Whitehead School of Diplomacy and International Relations is an ideal place to study international relations and practice diplomacy firsthand in a professional, dynamic, and culturally rich setting. For more information, visit diplomacy.shu.edu. Welcome back. Relations remain strained between China and Japan over the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. For more on this story, John Hensel reports. Heightened tensions over Japan and China's maritime dispute in the East China Sea pose a significant challenge to American policymakers. Wrapped up in the dispute over the Senkaku, or Diaoyu Islands, is the question of how to respond to a rising and increasingly nationalist China. China has contested the Japanese claim over the Senkaku Islands since the United States ceded control of the territory to Japan in 1972 through the Okinawa Reversion Treaty. Notably, the waters surrounding the islands have been estimated to contain sizable deposits of natural gas and oil. Possession of the islands grants extended territorial sea and exclusive economic zone rights under international law, providing economic benefit and administrative authority over the strategically important area. With China's rising energy consumption and strategic fears of encirclement, Beijing's interest in the islands is understandable. However, the islands resonate far more deeply than as mere economic and geostrategic concerns. To many in China, the islands represent a permanent symbol of Japan's role in the historical exploitation of China. Tensions between China and Japan have come to a head since an incident in 2010 when a Chinese fishing trawler rammed a Japanese Coast Guard vessel near the disputed islands. Last April, Tokyo Governor Shintaro Ishihara, an ultra-right-wing politician, planned for the Tokyo Metropolitan Government to purchase the islands from their private owner, and appointed criticism of the national government's administration of the islands. This plan was received negatively by Beijing, which voiced concern over Japanese right-wing influences in the dispute. To circumvent Ishihara's diplomatically troublesome meddling, the central government moved to purchase the islands itself in an attempt to maintain the status quo arrangement. Prime Minister Noda's $26 million bid for calm, however, failed stupendously. The perceived nationalization of Chinese territory sparked mass demonstrations against Japan across China last week in over 125 cities. Some protests were peaceful, while others turned into violent riots, where Japanese companies and products were attacked and destroyed. As the demonstrations grew, many Japanese factories in China shut down, creating uncertainties for the future of trade ties. The Chinese government did little to downplay anti-Japanese sentiments and dispatched marine surveillance force vessels to demonstrate China's authority over the isles. Against this backdrop of nationalist furor, China's once-a-decade leadership transition looms, stoking Washington and Tokyo's fears of a revisionist China. Beijing's seemingly intractable position concerning its maritime claims is most accurately viewed as an attempt to maximize the country's negotiation gains in future talks. Where favorable, Beijing has shown willingness to shelf historical considerations for joint development of resources while maintaining the legal and strategic positions necessary for developing its interests. The most damaging reality for the future of East Asian security, however, is that if the current course holds, Beijing will never make it to the negotiating table. Internally, China faces intense pressure from its populace to take a hard line on its historical issues that strike a chord with nationalist sentiment. Furthermore, China's ruling party is anything but wholly unified. The hawks inside the Communist Party of China are able to pander to the population's nationalist sentiments to gain prominence within the party and undermine their moderate adversaries. Given this political situation, leaders in Beijing will never be able to negotiate on maritime disputes without fear of political outmaneuvering or popular opposition. Even if Beijing could secure a geostrategic or economic win in the negotiations, any settlement short of absolute victory would fuel a hardliner narrative of capitulation, weakness, and betrayal. Crafting a response to China's mounting maritime assertiveness poses a serious dilemma for U.S. policymakers. When facing rising belligerent behavior, there are two main approaches, to deter the behavior or to appease it. If the United States were to implement a hard line with China over the dispute, an even stronger nationalist response may be incurred. Perceptions of American meddling and memories of Japanese militarism could galvanize the nationalist sentiment, harden the population's views of the outside world, and grow the ranks of hawks in government. 
A confrontational approach would play into the hands of the hardliners in Beijing by validating their bombastic views of the United States and Japan. A devolving political situation in China would only exacerbate the competition between the nations, and a catastrophic tit-for-tat paradigm leading towards war could emerge. However, if a weaker response to China's behavior were adopted to appease the nation's perceptions of victimization, hawks may still gain. If the United States or Japan were to completely capitulate on the maritime disputes, Beijing would learn a dangerous lesson. Belligerence gets results. This would again validate the hardliners' approach and facilitate their rise to prominence in the party and other state organizations. Incident escalation is deferred through a weak approach, but the underlying problems would still continue to fester. China's expansion of nationalist sentiment and territorial claims would continue. Beijing would be unable or unwilling to negotiate fairly with its neighbors. This would again validate the hardliners' approach and facilitate their rise to prominence in the party and other state organizations. The United States must carefully weigh its response to China's maritime assertiveness, taking into account the domestic realities that could distort Beijing's decision-making. Washington must avoid encouraging the success of Chinese nationalism through either too hard or too soft a strategy if it wishes to avoid conflict in East Asia. John Hensel, The Global Current. United States banking regulators have embarked on a seemingly new war against sanction and tax evasion offenders. On the latest effort, Bjorn Schwarzenbach files this report. On September 12, 2012, a former UBS employee turned whistleblower received a $104 million award from the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. Since 2007, Bradley Birkenfeld had been providing valuable information about the Swiss Bank's willful tax evasion practices, through which thousands of U.S. citizens avoided U.S. taxation by sheltering money in illegal offshore accounts. The IRS has collected $5 billion U.S. dollars in back taxes from UBS customers in addition to fining UBS $780 million. To put that into perspective, this total narrowly surpasses the United States economic aid in 2010 to Afghanistan and Iraq combined. Without key witness information from Birkenfeld, these billions would have remained uncollected. Although $5 billion barely cuts into the towering U.S. deficit, Desperately underfunded public programs are in need of these funds. However, this recent recouping of lost revenue has potential to alleviate some stress to the federal government's fiscal woes. As the Wall Street Journal reports, over $1 billion has been collected since 2007 through the Whistleblower Initiative. While some critics of the program question whether whistleblowers should be paid for speaking the truth, Mark Worth from the NGO Transparency International believes that no one can question the motives of people who try to do the right thing, Rather, it's about the message, not the messenger. While not only providing more incentive for information regarding illegal corporate activity, this large award sum has sent a clear message to corporate America. You will be caught. This recent development has been the latest in the U.S. stance against corruption around the world, while adding to the United States' portfolio of increased financial regulation. On July 21, 2010, President Obama signed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act which seeks to make large changes to financial regulations in the United States. As its title reads, the Dodd-Frank Act serves to promote the financial stability of the United States by improving accountability and transparency in the financial system. With numerous debates as to whether the Dodd-Frank Act can adequately overhaul the financial regulation system and is an appropriate government action, the usual political critics have taken their sides of the room. As an important feature that enhances the Dodd-Frank Act against the global market of corruption, Provision 1504, entitled Disclosure of Payments by Resource Extraction Issuers, has begun to lead the global fight against corruption. As the lead U.S. financial regulatory agency, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has only just approved the implementation of Section 1504 on August 22, 2012. The highlight of the provision is the requirement of all 1,100 SEC-registered oil, gas, and mining companies to disclose company payments to U.S. and foreign governments. In the developing world, corruption is a major factor for the continuous cycle of poverty. Because manufacturing and service industries are not yet developed, non-renewable resources such as oil, gas, or minerals are driving forces for these developing economies. Most times, the powerful elite either through a legitimate authority or military strength on control of the resource and profits. The revenue from the resource-dependent economies often does not benefit or even reach the average citizen. For example, according to a 2004 World Re Bank report, 80% of Nigeria's oil wealth was occurred to 1% of the country's population. 
multinational corporations seek to establish exclusive rights to these domestic resources by any means possible, often through bribery. This process further diminishes the power of the individual in attaining economic success. Additionally, civil society, along with the individual, cannot hold their governments accountable. Provision 1504 requires transparency when companies deal financially with extratives and foreign governments. By being able to have better governance, other domestic aspects in developing countries can begin to develop for more equal resource revenues. There can be more social programs and better health care access for all citizens, and in turn, the cycle of poverty can begin to end. The United States government is taking a front seat role in the fight against global corruption through the new IRS whistleblower initiative alongside the Dodd-Frank Act and specifically Provision 1504. Because corruption has a spillover effect on various other human development areas, it, in addition to bribery, needs to be addressed, and only after these issues have been addressed can developing countries move towards a better quality of life. Bjorn Schwarzenbach, The Global Current. And finally, technical producer Paul Murphy interviewed Mohamed Fidel, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Toronto, about the growing protests in the Middle East regarding the film The Innocence of Muslims, Here's a portion of that interview. Part of your expertise is Islamic law. What from this film violates Islamic law? Kind of a, a base, obviously there's, um, there's the main things. We're not allowed to depict um, the Prophet Muhammad in a, in a negative light. Um, what, what were the kind of, um, what, what, what is the basis for, for these protests? Why are, aside from it being um, a really um, awful film. What are the what are the basis for for the unrest? Well, I think we need to separate religious doctrine from, I guess, the empirical question of what is the basis of the unrest. I think the empirical causes of demonstrations and burnings and attacking embassies and other sorts of things um, they each have very different causal sequences depending on the context and location and the time. Religious doctrine is much easier to talk about. From the perspective of Islamic religious doctrine, of course, Prophet Muhammad is a very uh, important person, just as all the prophets are, but he, he occupies a particular point of reverence. And so in Islamic teachings, for example, one is not supposed to talk about the Prophet Muhammad the way one talks about any other human being. There is certain religious etiquette attached to talking about the Prophet and talking about his family that Muslims are expected to observe and that Muslims have generally held uh, in, in their relations with non-Muslims that non-Muslims must refrain from insulting the Prophet as sort of the condition precedent to civil relations with Muslims. So we saw the same protest from the Danish cartoons, and actually those cartoons have been republished this week. Um, where do you see the future of this going? Do you think there's going? Do you think that there's always going to be this unrest when, in the face of uh, um, of content like this, do you think there's always going to be this um, this kind of this level of protest, or do you think that there it could kind of taper off to be like, well, you know, that guy. He just kind of then brush it off and just be like, well, it's just not important. We're not going to worry ourselves with that. Well, I think there are two separate questions here. I think the first question is why are there protests? What triggers the protests? And then how come, you know, if it's, if it's solely a question of religious doctrine, how come the protests aren't much more pervasive than they actually are? That's what I was trying to say that we have to separate the theological question of the sanctity of the Prophet and the respect and love which Muslims hold for the Prophet from uh, their political reactions. Now one thing I'd like to emphasize of course is the minuscule percent, the minuscule numbers, relative numbers of Muslims participating in these demonstrations. So yes, you have demonstrations in different areas of the Muslim world, but it's an extremely small number, you know, not even approaching one-tenth of one percent. So we have to bear that in mind. Secondly, I think there are other factors driving these things. One of them, of course, is the collapse of authoritarian states in the Middle East, like in Egypt and Tunisia, and the weakening of authoritarian states elsewhere, particularly in the Arab world. And in those circumstances, there's a lot more freedom for popular uh, sentiments 
to bubble up in the streets and to make themselves uh, felt. But that doesn't mean that they are necessarily representative of even the meaning and the sentiment of people in Egypt or Tunisia. So whereas I suspect that the average person in Tunisia and, and Egypt found this film to be highly offensive, disgusting, inappropriate, and maybe even be willing to contemplate prosecuting the people who did this, they certainly don't think that demonstrating in front of the American embassy, much less attacking it, is something that's justified. So what does that lead me to think about in terms of the future? I think the most important goal we can all work for together is to strengthen the forces of democracy in the Arab world and the Islamic world. And to the extent that we have more and more stable democracies, which we don't have right now, we have transitional regimes that are working towards establishing stable democracies, I think these kinds of events will become more the non-events that they should be. I think the reason why things get out of hand in Tunisia and almost got out of hand in Egypt is precisely because we are in this delicate transitional stage in which the people of these respective countries are got, have gotten rid of authoritarian regimes but have not yet built new regimes and so law and order is still a big question mark. So in that circumstance, particularly where there's a lot of electoral competition, a lot of opportunity for demagoguery, there's an opportunity for things like this uh, to grow out of control. But again, I would point out to people that you should not necessarily believe everything you see in the media. Uh, the media has exaggerated dramatically the, the number of participants and the scope of these demonstrations. So I think really it's been a tempest in a teapot, and that's my general view of these things. Uh, going back to um, who is kind of how, how it's such a small population of the Islamic world, who do you think is starting it? Do you think it's the imams? Do you think it's regular people who are starting it? Who is Who's, who's kind of generating the protest, the, the, small, the small number of um, people to protest? And, and well, to protest what I would call them is do. religious political entrepreneurs. So right now, in the Arab world, one of the, I guess, not very helpful phenomenon is the spread of private media channels, particularly through, through satellite TV and the internet, which allows people uh, to sort of magnify their, their influence well beyond their their numbers. So for example, in Egypt, a well-known, sort of we can call him a televangelist, seized on these uh, on this film to kind of whip up religious sentiment and to try to convince Egyptians and other Arabs would be watching the show that there's this concerted anti-Muslim campaign in the United States. And so the internet and satellite TV are extremely deregulated forms of communication. They're basically free to everybody to use and exploit. And so that gives opportunities, not just for what we would say good speech to proliferate, but it also gives a very good opportunity for bad speech to proliferate. And in transitional societies coming out of authoritarianism, there's not a strong tradition of pluralism and respect for the opinions of others. And so um, there's a tendency for demagoguery, or there's a there's a risk that demagogic rhetoric can find traction among certain elements of society. And so that's why I'm saying that the answer here is, again, to further support consolidation of democracy, uh, not to have nostalgia for the days of dictatorship. Now, there's one thing I do think that, it's, that, that Americans in particular need to bear in mind. I think for a lot of Muslims, particularly in the Arab world, you know, just as Americans sort of watch what goes on in, let's say, Egypt or the Arab world generally, well, they watch what goes on in the United States. And it's not a very pretty sight from the perspective of Muslims in the Arab world to see what's going on in the United States vis-a-vis -vis popular currents about Islam. For the last 10 years, you know, since 9-11, a very powerful Islamophobic network has developed in the United States. It's been very well documented. The Center for American Progress published a very detailed report called Fear Inc. documenting the financial and intellectual ties and have given rise to this Islamophobic network. And it appears that they played a role in producing this movie. And so I think these are questions or these are problems that our societies collectively face in the United States, in the Arab world, the Muslim world generally, is how to confront forces that are not interested in cooperation within pluralism, but are interested in demonizing the other and trying to essentially uh, marginalize them, if not, if not wipe them out entirely. So I think the cure for that is 
democratic pluralism and cooperation, uh, not demonization. As always, after this broadcast airs, the full interview will be posted on our blog, blogs.shu.edu slash global current. Once more, I'm Kristen Beloza. And I'm Cameron Brown. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Global Current.